So friends, welcome to part two of ship construction. Now there were a few more definitions which were left in the previous session. We will be covering it in this session. The first and foremost is your parallel middle body. Now parallel middle body is this section as you can see over here. This section. It is the section to, uh, in the longitudinal or the lengthwise direction of the ship. The mid midship section which remains constant in shape as well as in area. So that is your parallel middle body. So this section which remains constant in your shape and area is your parallel middle body. Okay. Now another definition uh, is entrance. Now entrance is related to parallel middle body. Entrance as the name suggests it is the foremost portion. Now there is a uh, the formal most portion considering this as the water line now the, this portion the immersed portion of the ship forward to the parallel middle body is called entrance okay the immersed portion of the ship forward to the parallel middle body is called entrance the opposite of entrance is run this portion So run is nothing but the immersed portion of the ship aft of the parallel middle body is called run. So these are the three definitions. Now let's look into uh, another definition which is your garboard stake which I missed in the previous session. Now garboard stake is nothing but it is the first and foremost stake next to your keel. So if this is your keel, this is the keel plate. So the next plate, the next plating over here this plate in the port and starboard side is known as this stake is known as garboard stake or the stake adjacent to the keel plating is called your garboard stake okay so friends our next definition is uh, steeler plate. Now, steeler, uh, steeler plate is nothing but now these are present in the forward region of the ship or near the bow where the ends taper. Okay, so what happens is the streaks which are present. Okay, as you can see over here uh, in the parallel middle body se uh, section, the streaks are present in uh, uh, constant width. Okay, and towards the end where the streaks have to taper towards the end, the width decreases. Hence. To compensate for this decrease in width, a uh, single plate is used instead of two stakes. This plate which is used instead of two stakes is called your steeler plate. So this plating over here which you are seeing is steeler plate. Now steeler plate is used just for a better design, better construction and strength to be present. Steeler plate is used and uh, uh, so this is what steeler plate is. It can be present over here, it can be present over here as it depends on the ship design but usually it is present in the bow region where the ends taper and then comes your coffin plate and uh, coffin plate and shoe plate. So what is coffin plate and shoe plate? Now these are present at the ends of your keel keel plating. Now for let's consider this as the keel plate. Okay. Now this plating present over here and this plating present over here. Okay. This plate. The plate which connects the flat plate keel to the stem frame of the ship is called your shoe plate. So the plate which connects the flat plate keel to the stem frame of the ship is called your shoe plate and the plating which connects the flat plate keel to the stern frame of the ship is called your coffin plate.
So remember, coffin plate is present in the aft region and shoe plate is present in the forward region. So our next topic is what is watertight subdivision of the ship. Now, watertight subdivision of a ship. The name itself suggests it is the watertight subdivisions of a ship. Now, how are these subdivisions formed? If you want a watertight subdivision, you require what? Watertight bulkheads. So these are the watertight bulkheads. They may be spaced as required. Okay. Now the spacing of these watertight bulkheads is called your watertight subdivision of the ship. So this is how the definition comes. The watertight subdivision of the ship is nothing but it is the spacing. This spacing. The spacing of your watertight bulkheads is the watertight subdivisions of the ship. What is bilge keel? Now bilge keel, this structure what you are seeing over here, this structure is called bilge keel. Okay. What is its function? It has two important functions. One is that it damps the rolling moment. Okay. So dampening the rolling moment. So it dampens the rolling moment. This is its first and foremost important function. Second function is it provides for longitudinal strength to the ship. So bilge keel, it dampens the uh, rolling moment and provides for longitudinal strength. Now let's see how this structure is constructed. It is present out, outer, uh, this is the turn of bilge as we all know. It is, the plating is connected over there. Okay. This is the flat plate bar. Okay. Flat plate bar. And this structure, what you're seeing is an offset bulb plate. Offset bulb plate. Which dampens the rolling moment. Okay, now what is the, uh, the surveyor may ask you this question, draw this, uh, draw the bilge keel. So you have to draw this structure and then he may ask you what is the function of the flat plate bar. The function of the flat plate bar is that this plating is present in order to, uh, whatever the maintenance is done, in case your offset bulb plate breaks down. Okay, it will break from this point. It will break from this point. Okay. So it won't damage your inner shell, uh, your outer shell plating of the ship, because if the outer shell plating is damaged, then the uh, the cost of construction goes really high, and the damage is a major damage then. Whereas if the damage is from here itself, whatever construction is done is is from here itself. Okay, the maintenance would be carried out from this plating itself. Hence, uh, you are not touching your outer shell plating. Okay. The maintenance would be done from here itself. So this is the function of your flat plate bar. And uh, how long is the bench keel present on the ship? So from your uh, midship section, uh, uh, bench keel extends to one half of the length of the ship. One half of the length of the ship on either side. Okay. This is the uh, length for which the bilge keel is present and the bilge keel it tapers towards the end okay if uh, I'm drawing this structure over here sorry it tapers towards the end okay to avoid the stress concentration so this is how the bilge keel is present and these are uh, all the related questions related to it so the length is half the length from a midship on either side Okay, and uh, this is the function of bilge keel. So friends, our next topic under ship construction is stresses which are developed due to the forces experienced on the ship. These forces can be due to uh, from internal of the ship as well as externally. So the forces which are from, uh, experienced from within the ship result from the cargo, the weight of the ship, the machineries, your local loading which includes your uh, cranes, your uh, wind glasses, winches, etc. The machinery present on the ship. That is what your local loading does. 
so those forces result in a development of stresses that is these are the stresses which are developed from within the ship due to the forces within the ship now the forces which act externally as we all know externally air and water they will only present the forces so the water the force present from water is your hydrostatic pressure as you can see over here now if this is the ship your hydrostatic pressure will be acting from all the sides okay and coming to the force exerted by air is your uh, wind pressure okay the pressure by wind now it depends from where the wind is flowing okay well, from where the wind is blowing it depends on that uh, so this is about it then now these stresses are divided into global stresses and local stresses we will be discussing that also then then comes uh, those stresses from within the ship as you can see over here Now considering this as your accommodation and this is the loading okay the machinery space over here now from uh, from the as per the ship structure and the ship design itself the lo the loading is present differently hence the forces will be acting differently at different points on the ship okay for this there is a uh, and based on this uh, there is a buoyancy curve which we see now buoyancy curve is nothing but as you can see over here buoyancy curve is a curve which uh, this is buoyancy curve this will give you exactly where the buoyancy is acting maximum on the ship now the area within this curve it gives you the total up thrust which is acting on the ship okay so longitudinally lengthwise the total up thrust which is acting on the ship is what you get from the area within this curve which is your buoyancy curve okay now then comes your weight curve now weight curve is as per the loading as per the cargo loaded the weight curve is there okay this is your weight curve how much weight is acting okay how much weight is acting downwards now the resultant of your buoyancy curve and weight curve will give you now this is your buoyancy curve let's consider this as your weight curve okay now the resultant of these curves will give you your load curve okay now this is the load curve how load curve is helpful is now it the area of the load curve it uh, it helps you to determine the shearing force acting at particular point okay at particular points how much shearing force is acting is what you can get from the load curve so friends as you can see in this figure you have the weight curve you have the buoyancy curve as well as you have the load curve now in order to find the shearing force acting at a particular point you have to integrate the area like the, considering this as the point you want to find the shearing force at this point you have to integrate the area under the load curve up to this point okay the area under the load curve would be integrated up to this point of consideration which is uh, which would give you your shearing force at that point so next topic is static forces and dynamic forces as the name suggests static force now this is the ship it's on the water 
what forces are acting over here? The, one is the ship's weight and other is the buoyancy. Now, the resultant of these forces will give you the static forces. Uh, uh, and dynamic forces, this is the ship, this is water. The ship, when it is in motion, okay, when the ship is underway, uh, that is when your dynamic forces would be, uh, it would result in dynamic forces. That is the force due to the sea and the waves as well as the air. So those forces uh, which result from the ship's motion and due to the wind and waves acting on the ship are known as dynamic forces. Now what, how the bending moment occurs due to in static force and dynamic force, let's see it over here. Now considering the ship in still water, this is the ship in still water. Now what happens is uh, due to loading, if you, are, if you are loading it in this way, Okay, what happens is the buoyancy in the midship region is larger compared to the buoyancy at the sides. Okay, now when the buoyancy in the midship region is larger compared to the buoyancy acting on the sides, in this condition your ship is going to hog. In this condition, your ship will hog. This is called hogging. This is hogging bending moment, which occurs in still water. Now, when your ship is loaded in this way, where the buoyancy acting at this ends is larger compared to the buoyancy acting in the middle of the length of the ship in this condition the ship will sag okay this is called sagging bending moment These are the conditions which occur in still water. Now looking into the conditions which occur when the ship is in motion or the, when dynamic forces are, are acting are as follows. Let's consider this as the ship. What happens is the wave how the wave acts. Now, the wave as it is, it is acting over here in this way. The buoyancy in the mid midship section is larger compared to the buoyancy at the sides. Hence, when the buoyancy in the midship section is larger, the ship will hog. So this, this will result in hogging. Okay. This will result in hogging bending moment. And when When the buoyancy at the sides is larger compared to the buoyancy in the midship section, then your ship will sag. This will result in sagging bending moment. Okay. I'm not uh, drawing the sagging uh, condition which occurs. I have drawn it previously. I hope you understand. So the next important question is what are the six degrees of freedom a ship is free to move. Now the six degrees of freedom are as follows. Three linear and three rotational. Now the three linear uh, are as follows. One is heaving. The first and foremost is heaving. Considering this as the ship. Okay. So this motion is called heaving. Okay. As you can see in the figure over here. Now this motion is called heaving. Okay. Then comes your swaying motion. The swaying motion, if this is the ship in the starboard and port side, in the linear direction, it's called swaying. Okay. Then comes surging. Surging is in the linear direction. The third motion is called surging, which is in this direction. This motion of the ship forward and back is called surging. Now, for, uh, when sur in, uh, considering surging, the rotational motion in the direction of surging. So this is surging. The rotational motion in direction of the surging is called rolling. So this is called 
rolling the rotational motion in direction to the swaying now this was swaying so the rotational motion would be in this direction okay as you can see in the figure over here so the rotational motion is like this so this is called pitching so this is pitching then comes the rotational direction in heaving uh, this is heaving the rotational direction would be like this for heaving so the rotational direction to heaving is yawing okay so this is another moment so three linear moments and three rotational moments so three linear moments are your heaving swaying surging okay and your three rotational moments are rolling pitching and yawing these are your six degrees of freedom